Our second speaker is Andres Rodriguez Posin. He is a professor uh, uh, of economic geography at the London School of Economics, uh, where he was previously the head of the Department of Geography and Environment. He is the immediate past president of our Regional Science Association International. He served as vice president of RSAI uh, before that, and also vice president and secretary of European Regional Science Association. He is a regular advisor to numerous international organizations, amongst other European Commission, European Investment Bank, uh, World Bank, OECD, International Labour Organization, and FIO. He is currently the editor of uh, Economic Geography and sits on editorial board of 30 others, quarterly journal, including many leading international journals in economic <laughs> geography and regional science. Hey now. All right, so, uh, hello and uh, Welcome everyone. I would like to start my presentation by thanking the Regional Science Association International for having me here and of course the local organisers for organising this wonderful congress here in Goa at this time of the year. And I would like to also uh, thank all of you for coming, in some cases for a short way, in other cases for a long way, to what is what I like to be a wonderful gathering. The paper I'm going to talk about today. It's called The Revenge of the Places That Don't Matter. And uh, this is a paper that has a life of its own. And it shows to what extent we academics cannot control what we say or write. One of the first presentations of this paper happened not that long ago. It was in August last year, the end of August last year at the European Regional Science Association Conference, but it happened in a bar in front of 40, 45 odd people. And then the paper was actually received with mixed reviews. Some people thought it was fantastic, other people thought it was too English, to put it like that. What has happened since is something that I could not control. It has taken a life of its own, and it has become an independent paper used by many people to actually defend a lot of different interests. To give you an idea, it has been used by Catalan nationalists to actually support the argument that Catalonia is better off as an independent country. Nothing further for my mind. After all, I am Spanish and I am from Madrid. It has been used by the Daily Express in Britain and actually used profusely to justify Brexit. Nothing further from my mind as I am one of the biggest uh, victims, I would say, like many other foreigners living in the UK of Brexit. But on the other hand, it has been used by massively by Italians, virtually to no avail, before uh, the elections, to actually try to warn people that if regional disparities are not taken into account, the main risk is that we're going to end up with what we have now in Italy, a split country based along populist lines. In fact, it was retreated so much in Italy that one day I was a trending topic in a city in Italy, in Bari, and I never imagined myself that I was going to be trending together with Beyonce. That's the closest I'm going to be there. But it has also been used in the Netherlands, it has been used in Brazil very often for the same purposes, and right now by the European Union as a justification that we need policies to counter regional disparities, but we also need a different type of policy. And how does it all start? In order for this to start, we have to go back 10 years to look at this person over here, who is there because for many reasons. One, He's a friend of mine. But he's a friend of mine who thinks in a very, very different way than I do, at least professionally. His name is Tim Lloydney. He, at that time, 10 years ago, was a reader in economic history at the London School of Economics, so we are colleagues. But he was also one of the most prominent uh, British urban economists. And he had written 
in the summer of 2008, a report that created quite a lot of controversy. That report basically said that in Britain there has been too much done for areas that are declining and that much of that money is better off, would have greater returns, if invested in those areas that have got the most potential to grow. That is mainly telling people, let's forget about trying to develop the declining areas of the North of England and put the money where we have got the biggest chance of attaining returns, that is in London. And to be honest, Tim is a courageous person. You might see him and say, well, he doesn't look like a, a very sturdy guy, but he is tenacious. And because his paper created some commotion, he decided to go and defend his line in Liverpool Cathedral. For those of you that do not know Liverpool, Liverpool is the biggest city, sorry, the, has the biggest cathedral in the whole of the UK. The Anglican Cathedral can host 5,000 people. So there he went, Tim, on the 16th of October 2008, and in front of a crowd of 5,000 people, moderated by the Bishop of Liverpool, he came and told the people in Liverpool, look, we have tried since the end of the Second World War, every type of what is known in Britain as regeneration strategy to make you better off, to generate jobs, create greater prosperity, and make sure that there is more economic dynamism. But all this effort has been to no avail. The problems of the North of England today, in this case in 2008, so he said, are the same as they were 30 or 40 years ago if they hadn't gotten worse. His point was, we should end up, as a country, in this case the UK, trying to subsidise or promote development in areas that are declining are unlikely to stem that process of decline. And he came with a solution. If you want to prosper, whether you are in Liverpool, or in Sheffield, or in Middlesbrough, or in Sunderland, you should migrate. And you should migrate where there's opportunity. And where's there opportunity? In those places in the southeast of England, mainly London, but also Oxford and Cambridge, that have got the greatest potential to growth, for growth. And if you cannot migrate, it's because of one constraint that there's so much planning regulation that it prevents building and building affordable housing in that area. Does that sound familiar? Yes, it's the main argument that is being now yielded by urban economists all over the world, especially in North America, to try to promote more building in the most dynamic and prosperous cities, mainly in the largest cities. But what Tim was not realizing, and what many urban economists do not realize these days, is that he was telling a lot of people, in this case in Liverpool, but generally the people in the north of England, as they're being told now if they live in Kansas, or if they live in, in um, Wisconsin, or if they live in Ohio, or if they live in Indiana, that the places where they were born, in many cases, where they have lived all their lives, where they have loved, where they have are planning to die, where they have their personal binds, do not matter. That these are places that have got no future, and your future is better somewhere else. And although he said he was sorry to the people of Liverpool that that was the case, he said, we cannot change the way economic works, and if you want to prosper, or if your children want to prosper, they have to move somewhere else. What he told them was, look, in Britain, there are places that matter, places like London, where you have to build on the brownfield sites, you have to create two more miles of building around the green belt, creating another million homes, and you have to put in Cambridge and Oxford around 400 additional, 400,000 additional homes. So these are the places that matter. Of course, Cambridge would not look like that. You can imagine Cambridge with the manicure lawns of the colleges full of new houses because that's where you're going to have to put them, otherwise it's going to be almost impossible. And also, there are places that don't matter. Whether you're from Middlesbrough, from Birmingham, from Sheffield, from Liverpool, 
from many of the cities of Birmingham, you're going to be worse off, so you have to start thinking that the future is going to be elsewhere. And apply to other parts of the world, so for example, you go to uh, India, sorry, India, China, here you have places like uh, Beijing and Shanghai, that would be the places that matter, whereas Lanzhou, for example, a city of 7 million, but also Wuhan, which is one of the cities with the worst performance, would fare much worse. Translated into Indian, you're okay if you're in Goa, you're okay if you are in Karnataka and Bangalore, you're okay if you are in Delhi or in Haryana, you're okay if you're in Maharashtra and in Mumbai, Assam, Bihar, perhaps Uttar Pradesh, Orissa, those are not the places that have got the future. Of course, the question is a question of scale. Disparities in Britain are one fifth of what you have in India. And the size of the country, you can compare 1.4 billion people to about 62, 63, 64 million that there are in the UK. And I must say that to a certain extent, in order to polymerize, there's some argument and there's some work in the argument that was promoted by Tim Lorne at Liverpool Cathedral and by the urban economists. In general, agglomeration matters. If there's something we have learnt from the new economic geography is that the bigger the city, the better the externalities, and the higher the positive externalities, the bigger the chances to generate economic activity, economic growth, new employment, new inventions, and productivity. If you add that density and the possibility through density for people with high skills, with new ideas, to actually mingle and interact, what you end up is with what Glaser has told, called the triumph of the city in his 12, uh, 2012 uh, seminal book, in which, if you look at the subtitle, it's simple, how our greatest invention, invention not the printing press, not agriculture, not writing, but the city makes us richer, smarter, greener, healthier, and happier. What else do you want than a city, and not just any city, but a big, big city? And of course, cities have got benefits in terms of productivity. There's quite a lot of work on that, and there's a lot of uh, advantages, especially when you improve transportation to make cities bigger and more dynamic. And there's plenty of evidence around that. The world, over time, has become much more urban. In this map, it puts us almost 60 years ago, 1960, and it's, you have the colors at the back indicate the level of urbanization. What you have there is places like India, but also the whole of uh, South and Southeast Asia, but most of Africa, and that level have very limited levels of urbanization, less than 25%, and you can see that most of the big cities in the world were concentrated in Europe, in North America, to a lesser extent in China and India, and there were only two real megalopolis, there was like Tokyo and New York. We fast forward to more or less today, this is real data from 2011, and what we see is that first the colors become darker, many countries in the world are massively urbanized, as was highlighted, India is lagging behind in terms of percentages, but in terms of sheer, uh, sheer size of cities, what you have is that the number of cities has grown massively in many parts of the world, but increasingly in Asia. South Asia and India, you can see the large megalopolis, but also, for example, in China. Uh, this, according to the urban economists, should be good, and it should be a boon for India, that there are more people concentrated in cities, and especially large cities, is going to generate those positive analysis that is going to drive India out of lower levels of development into a development track and sailing through the whole potential middle income track that many countries meet at a certain level of development, around $15,000 per head per year. And of course, if you take a look, many large cities are doing extremely well. When we think about New York, when we think about London, about Paris, about Tokyo, these are prosperous and in recent years, not always, but in recent years, have been significantly dynamic. And there's also an element of size here. When you put next one, for example, in the UK, the country where I work, 
You have London, the biggest city, has done particularly well in comparison to Liverpool, which is where Tim Loynick went and told people, yeah, your future's not there, and Liverpool has done better than, middle, uh, than uh, uh, Newcastle, Newcastle better than Middlesbrough, for example. But the same in France. You have Paris doing better than Marseille, and Marseille better than Lyon. But hang on a minute, this story is not always true. What you have is size matters, but it not always matters in the right direction. Michael Storper has written recently with some colleagues from Kemeny, Nadju McCarran, a nice book about the fortunes of Los Angeles and the San Francisco, the Bay Area, in which Los Angeles, which is normally twice the size of the Bay Area, has done, despite not doing particularly badly in the North American context, much better over the long run than uh, Los Angeles. The same applies to Canada. Montreal was traditionally the biggest city, the financial center, the industrial city, the cultural city. Today, that's until the 1970s, 1980s, has suffered a strong decline. Today, Toronto is much bigger, much more dynamic, also much more diverse by parts of margin. But if we're in India, you can take a look at the situation. Calcutta was traditionally the pearl of India. At the beginning, the Brits settled there for a reason. Today, Calcutta has been lingering and has been overtaken in terms of economic dynamism, not just the city, by cities that are as large, if not larger, Delhi, Mumbai, but also by smaller cities uh, that have been doing extremely well, Bangalore, Hyderabad, or, uh, for example, Chennai. And when you go to many parts of the developing world, places like Africa, you've got pictures of Lagos, places like uh, Uganda, Kampala, but also here in, the, uh, in South Asia, Karachi in Pakistan and Dhaka. These are not cities that are characterized by having large agglomerations and economic dynamism. In fact, agglomerations are very often not much by the same level of dynamism. I'll challenge you to put the name of, let's say, Nairobi, or the name of Lagos, or the name of uh, uh, Dhaka in Google. When you put the name of Paris, or you put the name of New York, what you see is, click on images and you'll see the Eiffel Tower, and you'll see a fantastic city. When you do the same in New York, you'll see New York skyline. When you put Dhaka, which is a big city, is going to be bigger than New York in relatively no time. Most pictures show you hordes of people. Does that actually lead to greater economic development? I doubt it. In fact, most of the analysis highlights that in developing countries, agglomeration is actually detrimental, has been detrimental for economic growth. So that's the story. And this is what seems to be happening, and this is the narrative that has had significant influence on policy and decision making. The World Bank, in its 2009 World Development Report, following the new economic geography and the urban economics, actually highlighted that for many developing countries, they should bet on their best goals. And that meant putting your money not on rural areas, not in intermediate cities, but focusing mainly on your larger city. If you were Ghana, forget about the north, forget about the Shanti coast, put all your bets in Accra. If you were in Nigeria, also focus on Lagos. But what have been the consequences of all this? Well, the first consequence is a global rise of within-country inequality. I just want to take a, you to take a look at this figure over here, this colors, and it's very simple. It's a traffic light sort of uh, indicator. If it's red, it means that inequalities have gone up. If it's orange, it means that inequalities have gone up, but marginally. If it's in green, it means that inequalities have actually declined. And this is just for developing countries. What you take is, and this is before the, even the, the boom in commodities, if you take here, most of the colors are in red. It means that inequalities have increased. Those that are in green don't get fooled. You have 
On the one hand is Colombia, on the one, Indonesia, uh, sorry, Peru, uh, South Africa, and Turkey. With the exception of Turkey, all the others have reduced disparities mainly because of the location of natural resources. So clearly what we have had is that there has been a polarization within our countries. And when we go to Europe, and I, I want you to remember, there are parts that have done well, many parts of Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the Baltic states, for example, Poland, Slovakia, but also some big cities here, a place like uh, Budapest, Ljubljana, capitals, uh, Bucharest, but many other areas, and I want you to remember the northeast of France, I want you to remember the south of Italy, I want you to remember Lancashire, which is the region that voted the most for Brexit in the UK, have done not particularly well. And in fact, when we look at the performance within countries, you get to the stream here in green are what I call the overperforming regions. What is an overperforming region? It's a region that over a long period of time, in this case 1919 to 2014, has grown above the average of that country. And then the performing are those that have grown below the average. You get to a place like France, there's only one region that has performed above the average, and that is the region of Paris. All the rest has done worse. But in most other countries, it is the already richest uh, regions, the north of Italy, the northeast of Spain, the south of England, the south of Germany, that are the ones that have done well. Whereas, East Germany, remember that, the north of England, the place where Tim Loyne came and said, there's no future here. Uh, most of the northeastern France and eastern France, the south of Italy, Greece, with the exception of Athens, and some of the islands are the ones that have been suffering. And, well, this is the same, it applies uh, to many parts of uh, England. Let's say this is the south of England, for example, this is uh, uh, the north of England, and this is London, that was not doing particularly well until the 1990s, and it has shot up. And you have to be warned that, although you might think this is a story for developing countries, the risk in emerging countries, such as China and India, is much greater. <coughs> simply because of the fact that territorial disparities are bigger, and in many cases, with some exceptions, China is doing slightly better, they have grown much faster in recent years than they have done in developed countries. So I'm telling you, telling you the case of India, regional disparities, inter-territorial disparities are five times those that you find in the UK, four times those that you find in Europe. In the case of China, we're talking, depending on the indicator that you use, between three and a half and five times as well. What has been the reaction? When you go and tell people in one place that their future is no longer there, either they can just say, I am a lamb, go to slaughter and take it, or they can react. Now, how have they reacted? Well, they have reacted in a way that very few people are actually expected, which is through the ballot box. They have said, if I have no future, I'm going to act and react in a different way. And we've seen election after election over the last two years, in most of the developed world, that this has been the case. The first year's warning was in June 2016, when the Brits voted for Brexit. And you take a look, here's the map, with the exception of Scotland, where it's concentrated in the south. But I like this map much better, in which it tells you the cities, the ones that have done well, the most prosperous, mainly London, Oxford and Cambridge, to a lesser extent Leeds, Manchester and Liverpool, are the ones that voted to remain in the European Union. This is Lancashire, the region in the UK that has had the lowest level of growth over the last 25 years, that had, had the biggest share of votes, 75% for Brexit. But that was followed very quickly by uh, Trump election in November 2016 in the US. This is not the share of vote for Trump. This is the swing towards Republicans or towards uh, Democrats in the different states of the US. And well, in this case, in counties. And you take a look, it's the whole of the Rust Belt. Semicircle circle around the Great Lakes, going all the way from Minnesota to upstate New York and Maine, in which actually changed the election. Once you have Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, 
declared for Trump. Clinton had no chance, despite the fact that she got 3 million more votes than Trump. And these are areas that have been declining for a long time. France, cities voting for Macron. The northeast, the eastern part of France, the southeast voting for Le Pen. And what you have is that the populist option was mainly concentrated in small and medium-sized towns and rural areas. The biggest city in France voting in the first round of the election for um, uh, uh, Marie Le Pen was Toulon, which is a city of about 150,000 uh, people. But you have Germany, I saw you the picture of East Germany, concentration in the southeast of the vote from the stream right and the stream uh, left. Stream case in Hungary, in which populism triumphs all over the country, with exception of the three main cities. And then in Italy, where you have the concentration of the vote for the five star party in the south. The question is are we surprised? In the West, in the developed countries, we have been extremely surprised by this. If you are from a developing country, you're much less surprised. If you are Argentinian, this is something you have lived with since the 1930s. But let's take a look, for example, the Bolivian presidential elections in 2009. A populist president got the most votes in the poorest areas of the country. So where you have the indigenous population, where you have those that are the most destitute, you got very few votes in the richest areas of the country. And you have to go to Thailand to see the most clear example. Thailand has, was for many, many years the poster child of international organizations. It was the fastest growing country in the whole of South, Southeast Asia. It led to a polarization of the country because disparities in Thailand are the biggest you can find anywhere for which we have got data. When we're talking about India and Europe, and we are talking about a dimension of 3 to 1 to 4 to 1, when we go to Thailand, it's between 8 and 12 to 1 relative to, to Europe. So it's twice the level of disparities of India. Between very poor mountains areas in the north, and the northeast, and the low, lowlands of the center, and a lot of wealth that is concentrated in Bangkok and surrounding areas, and in the tourist areas of the south. Growing country in the whole of Southeast Asia. So, what was regarded as the country that had the most future has been overtaken not just by Malaysia, Indonesia, and Vietnam, but also by places like uh, Cambodia and Laos. Thank God for the Thais at least uh, that Myanmar has done not better than, than uh, Thailand in this respect. And the question is are we surprised? Well, there would be a lot of people that would come and say, I told you so. But the fact is that the majority of social scientists, and especially the economists, have been massively surprised. Why? Because we were told that, yes, agglomeration, concentration of economic activity in certain areas would have some negative externalities. But we were told to expect the wrong type of externalities. There would be three types of externalities. High line rents, Congestion and pollution. And these are important negative externalities. Having said that, none of these externalities so far is threatening to derail the system. The second type of externality, which is what the economists are going about, it's bigger T, but it's also when uh, Danny Roderick tries to explain the rise of populism, is the whole idea of interpersonal inequality that we have the poorest of the poor, that this new economy is generating a polarization, and the poorest of the poor are being left out, and that's creating significant problems. But, when you take a look at the elections, and what's happening across the world, the poorest of the poor in the United States voted together with the richest on the East and the West Coast for Hillary Clinton. The richest in Philadelphia and the poorest in the inner city ghettos of Philadelphia, they all voted for Clinton. In fact, when you look at places like Ohio, when you look at places like uh, uh, rural Pennsylvania, when you look at places like Wisconsin, when you look at places for Mich uh, like Michigan, the average Trump voter is better off and richer than the average Clinton voter. In London, 
the poorest boroughs in the country, the poorest districts, places like Tower Hamlets, like New England, they voted to remain. Together with the richest boroughs in the country, like Westminster or Hammersmith and Fulham. By contrast, in the north, the rich and the poor actually voted to leave in many parts of the north. So clearly, the personal equality might in the future set our cities on fire, but so far is not doing it. The game changer is another one, which is the negative externality that no one actually highlighted. And in fact, for many years, I am, after all, a geographer, an economic geographer, I was told repeatedly by economists, why should you care about territorial inequalities? You should care about people. Well, people live in places, and where they live matters for their welfare, for the way they think, and for the way they react. And it seems to matter much more than their actual level of income to a certain extent. It's the territories that have been left behind, the territories that have seen very long periods of very low or no growth, those that have shed industrial jobs, and very often sometimes agricultural jobs, that have seen massive brain drain because there's no future, that have been told you have no future here, you have no opportunities, your children or you have to move out to the places that are more dynamic, are the ones that are generating this geographies of this content, as has been uh, defined by Phil McCann, and the ones that are actually revolting in the ballot box in order to highlight this sort of change. So, what is the question? Why are they revolting? Is it that we haven't done anything for them? Well, if you take a look at what Tim Lloyd had said, a lot has been done. In fact, many of these places in developed countries have received for quite some time a lot of attention and significant funding for the different levels of inter intervention. And it has been at the national level, welfare transfers. Most taxing or systems of taxation are actually progressive. They are progressive at interpersonal level, but they are also progressive at interterritorial level. I have three countries here as examples. The United States, uh, Great Britain and Spain. I'm going to focus just because of time on UK and Spain. In the UK, three regions, so my taxes in London, the South East, and to a much lesser extent, the East of England, are subsidising, if you want to be put it in that, in those sort of words, the rest of the country. And in some cases, to a very large extent. So, for example, the, um, this is the whole of England, but the northwest of England is receiving more than 20 billion euros of transfers, positive transfers, by the, actually, the England revenue in the UK. But it is the same in the case of Spain. Well, the Catalans are reporting because they're saying that Spain is stealing from us. I am actually from Madrid, and Madrid is actually paying much more than Catalonia. But it is really two regions, Catalonia and Madrid, to a lesser extent the Balearic Islands, and Valencia that are paying in for the rest. So there's a lot of transfers that lead to very often expenditures in welfare. The second argument is public employment. And here is more or less the same story. I've done this graph for every single country in the European Union, and it is the same. You always imagine that it's going to be the capitals that have the highest share of employment in the public sector. That's where you have the ministries. And you would imagine that they are all working there. No. Most public employment is generated in the poorest regions. And you can say, well, this is skewed in the UK because you've got London here. But if you take out London, it is the same story. 28 countries, 28 results that are exactly the same. It's actually better than uh, Janet's uh, 17 or 16 percent uh, perception. I was not expecting this. I was expecting a lot of diversity. There's no diversity uh, whatsoever. The second thing is, have we not invested at the subnational level, and have we not done enough? The problem is we have done the wrong things. Some examples from our country. I was hearing today in some presentations before, but also in the previous session here in the plenary, that we need a lot of infrastructure. Yes, we need infrastructure. And if you don't have infrastructure, infrastructure is essential for growth. But it can often, when you have enough resources, become a sort of a drug. 
This is what is increasingly known as, known as the Iberian disease. In my country, like Spain, we have the second largest network of high-speed trains in the world, only after China. The biggest by far in terms of high-speed per inhabitant or per GDP. What for? We have plenty of empty stations. This train station here at the Expo Station is available. It's only seen one train, high-speed train, in the last 26 years. You had lines that were open and closed one year later. Why? Because maintenance was 18,000 euros per day. Average passengers per day, two trains, was nine. Not 90 or 900, nine. In a country like Spain, we have 56 airports, eight of which have got less than 10,000 passengers per year, and many of them are empty. And you have to sell airports for virtually nothing. The Ciudad Real Airport, and this is recent, 2015, that cost a billion as a PPP airport, was sold in auction because there was never a plane there apart from one to make a movie by Almodovar. And the biggest bidder was a Chinese individual that made a bid of 10,000. The year later, it was not sold to that individual bidder, it was declared void, and then it was rebidded the year after. The same Chinese group then bidded 40, uh, 40 million and actually got the airport. But you can make a calculation between a gap of a billion to 40 million. So where are the 960 million over gone? And you have motorways that are all, in many cases, with no cars and bankrupt. Madrid, Toledo, and we're talking about Madrid, the third largest city in the European Union. This motorway, which is a toll motorway, two years ago, after three years of recovery in terms of traffic, had 1,000 vehicles per day. So what do we have here? I'm just going back. We have a lot of white elephants, and a situation in which everything that has been done for these regions has not helped to mobilize the potential that many of these regions, less developed areas, still have. Why? Because in some cases, a lot of welfare transfers and a lot of public employment has promoted dependency. In other cases, the white elephants have created first white elephants, activities or buildings uh, infrastructure that has no use and massive opportunity cost because there has been much less investment. To give you an example, I'm now going to pick just on my country, Spain. I'm going to take Portugal. After all, we got the executive here. Portugal has got the best endowment of motorways per GDP in the world by quite some margin. But in Portugal, until relatively recently, one in, third, uh, one in three of high school students did not finish high school. You can have state-of-the-art, the best endowment of motorways in the world, and then also have problems in, on other areas. And this is perpetuating that whatever is being done is not having an impact, and this is creating massive resentment, because it's promoting this idea that there is no future, or that the future lies elsewhere. And of course, it's not that everyone can leave. I cannot leave that easily, because now I am the wrong age. If I were 20, I would leave. I migrated when I was 20. At the age of 50, I'm not going to migrate. Or it's much less likely. I might not leave because my parents are old. My, my mother is old. Because I got friends in the place I live. Because I got net ties. My children are there. Because I love the place where I am. But I'm not going to be told by others that my future lies elsewhere. And this is something that you have to bear in mind that economic inequalities can lead to social resentment and to political problems that we're going to see. So what can be done? The problem is increasingly clear, seems to be a territorial problem, not an economic uh, problem. Not an inequality problem, not an agglomeration problem. It's a question that when you have significant disparities and places that are declining, you're going to end up with a situation that creates, creates this geography of discontent. So there's a need for policy, but not necessarily more policy. There has been quite a lot of policy 
at least in developed countries, much less in developing countries. We need a better policy. A different policy that is away from simply subsidizing uh, less developed regions or declining regions. A policy that is away from big white elephants that actually promote a lot of ribbon cutting by decision makers that might be popular in the short term but have got relatively little impact in the long term towards a policy that I'm going to argue is place sensitive. And I'm not going to get into great details about that because, I mean, if you're interested in this, and I'm going to highlight them in the conclusions, you can go to this working paper uh, that I've written with uh, Simone Manino and Michael Stoker, in which we go and set up in much greater detail what the policy should be about. What I'm going to do now in the conclusion highlight is how to what extent this place sensitive policy can make, can make a difference. Why? I'm going to say that Territorial inequality is that for a long time people thought would have no bearing, and especially not territorial inequalities, but the increase in territorial inequalities is becoming a fundamental stepping stone for a system with all its problems that is probably much better than the alternative, and I'm going to get into that in a moment. If you keep on leaving places behind, telling people that the best solution is to encourage mobility, People are going to move to a certain extent, but a lot of people are not going to move. And the worst part is that increasingly people are saying, well, it doesn't matter because these people are going to die. No, we're seeing that people move to cities in an escalator sort of form. They move when they're in their 20s, they make their career, and very often they return to their place of origins or they go to smaller cities uh, later on. Very often they move in developing countries, for example, in emerging countries, to smaller cities because they are more prosperous, they are more dynamic, they are safer. The quality of life, and forgive me, there's a, uh, a view from Sao Paulo here, in a place like Campinas, is probably today much higher than it is in the case of Sao Paulo. So that's one of the reasons. And if you are left behind and you feel that you have no future, you're going to revolt. You're going to revolt and you're going to attack these very factors on which recent prosperity in many parts of the world has been based and in the world's whole. You're going to be in a situation whereas people in the south of Italy have said, we are sinking and we know we have no future because we've been told that many times, but we're sinking the boat with us. So if we go down in the south, is the whole of, the whole of Italy that goes down. If European integration and globalization has not done anything good for the north of England or for the east of England, we're taking London, you Londoners, that come to us and tell us, you have got no future, you have to move to where I am and become like me, we're taking you down because you are really conceited. And who is it going to affect? Well, first and foremost, the ones that are going to lose. Bar Laws at the University of Groningen, together with Phil McCann and some colleagues, uh, Frank Van Oort in Rotterdam, have for the last few years look at, been looking at the impact of Brexit. Who is going to suffer from Brexit? Well, it's mainly those areas that have voted for Brexit massively that depend much more on trade with the rest of the European Union. In the south of Italy, those are the areas that get the greatest level of subsidies from the European Union. But by doing that, they are taking down London with them. And they will be taking down Milan and they will be taking down Rome. So the prosperity of agglomeration is going to disappear because the negative externality came from where it was unexpected. The foundations of recent prosperity are being shaken. And that is bad. Is it that? Not because I do cherish the current system. Although globalization has put in places like India and in places like China, but in many parts of the world with all its problems, a lot of people have has lifted them out of poverty. And in general, we don't we have a short memory, but the UK and most of the UK has left much better since it opened its borders in the mid-1990s than before that. So what can we do? I mean, there are several options. The first one is, forget about this and let's do absolutely nothing. Well, the problem is, I don't think that's a solution. 
If we do nothing, the level of caloric sanction is going to increase, and we're going to end up with the problems that we have today multiplied by 10. Once we start having authoritarian regimes in specific countries, we know from history, and I want to remind you of the 1930s and what happened afterwards, it's very difficult to go back. Second option is what the urban economists are saying, encourage migration, is what Tim Lonick said in, uh, in Liverpool Cathedral. Allow people to migrate, but not everyone can migrate. If you haven't got the right skills, you haven't got the right age, if you are attached to your place, you're not going to be able to migrate. And those people are not going to die away as some people are expecting. <coughs> Linked to that is you bet on your top cities. But is it wise? What we are seeing, and there's increasing research, that in many parts of the world, the cities that are doing much, much better are intermediate cities. Cities very often that are between 250,000 and a million people. Depending on the country, in some countries, bigger cities are also doing better. Some of the big cities are also doing well. But many of the cities between a million and 10 million are not particularly doing that well. And I have to remind you, if you go to places like, for example, the US, you have big cities doing well, New York, uh, the Bay Area, Detroit, which was at a certain point the third largest city in the UK, has had a decimal trajectory for a long, long time. And then the question is, how long is this going to last? London, where I work, has done extremely well over the last 20 years. But that was preceded by 50 years of decline, not just absolute decline, in, sorry, relative to the rest of the UK. London was doing worse than the rest of the UK. Now, it's been 20 years that it has done better. The question is, how long is that going to last? And am I sure that London is always going to do better than, for example, Birmingham or Leeds? Am I sure that Paris is going to be always the engine of France? And even if we are sure, at what cost? If Paris doing extremely well is going to bring us an authoritarian regime led by a neo-fascist government, is that a cost worth paying? My answer is probably not. But of course we might have different perceptions on this. Should we decentralize or should we devolve? This is something that is not new, but it's a lot, a lot of people are bringing me to say, should we decentralize? Well, we got an example here. We have tried this across many parts of the world, especially in developing countries, and most of the results have been an absolute disaster. Uh, in the case of Indonesia, big bang decentralization in the late 1990s, when you decentralize in places where with inadequate institutions, with poor institutions, low levels of governance. If you have four governments at the national level, you are going to have perhaps four governments, equally four governments or worse governments at the local level because there's less uh, qualifications. And then you can have social and welfare policies, which is something that is now being advocated by urban economists. There's a paper that just came out by uh, Ed Glaser and uh, Summers that not that long ago coined the phrase subsidize people, not places, saying let's subsidize now places. There's no future, they're saying, in places like West Virginia or places like uh, uh, the Rust Belt in, uh, in Pennsylvania or in Wisconsin, you have to permanently subsidize those places. But this is something that we have been doing in Europe for decades. The south of Italy has been subsidized since the 1950s. Has it improved in terms of relative catch-up with the North? No. Has it created a dependent economy? Yes. Is that a dependent economy more capable than it was in the 1950s to fend for itself? No. Is that dependent economy reacting? Yes, we're seeing that, and we're seeing what's happening to Italy even before they have a government form. So that sort of subsidization is not going to work. Social and political tensions may arise, and the result is uh, greater polarization and perhaps logical risks. My suggestion is that we need to do place sensitive policies. What are place sensitive policies? Policies that are solidly grounded on theory and evidence, but can be adapted to specific different conditions and different situations. Maximize the development potential of his territory combining people-place with place-based approaches 
and empowering local stakeholders, meaning that they own their own policies, but you can, actually they are responsible for the future, they are empowered, but they can get financial, technical advice and support from elsewhere. Will this work? Well, it's difficult. It's not that there's a magic wand that is going to change the situation from one night to the other. But we need to try it, and we need to try it harder and try it better. Because if we don't do it, the chances that we revert to a situation in which many countries move towards autarky, in which many countries move towards greater nationalism, is risking having a world that is less prosperous, less dynamic, and a world in which the risk of more people falling into poverty and the risk of conflict is going to be greater. Thank you very much.